evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Julianne Frain. I'm the Research and Programs Coordinator here at the BAMP Sport Medicine Foundation. Uh, can actually everyone hear me okay? Just give a wave on your camera if you can. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to make sure my sound is working. Uh, so one of our mandates uh, as a charity is to pro provide free evidence-based uh, edu educational programming to improve musculoskeletal, so uh, bone and joint injury prevention and management knowledge uh, in our communities. So we're very, very happy uh, that Dr. Delia Roberts agreed to give this talk here tonight. So she's here to discuss her research on how nutrition and sleep can impact your performance um, at the Hill, as well as your injury risk. So Dr. Roberts holds a master's in exercise biochemistry and a PhD in medical science, as well as a research fellowship with the American College of Sports Medicine. So she's had a lot of uh, great success applying what she's learned from her research uh, in the fit for work programs that she has developed for a multitude of industries that include snow sports. So that's what we'll be talking about uh, tonight or what she'll be talking about tonight. Uh, but she's also developed programs for forestry, transportation, medicine, wildland firefighting, uh, and the food and hospitality industry. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Roberts, and welcome everyone again. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Roberts now, who will um, uh, take control of the meeting and share her screen. So thank you, uh, Delia. There we go. Sorry. Um, <laughs> starting over again. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be invited to participate in these programs and the Bounce Sport Medicine Group um, with you, the foundation, does very important research. So um, it's nice to be able to support them and talk a little bit about what I've done with my career. Um, it began in performance. And so what are we going to talk about today is mostly performance. But the format that I'm using is the same as uh, you saw with the Knees for Skis presentation. So um, I'm going to pose a few questions from time to time and give everyone an opportunity to see if they know what the answers are. And then um, you can use your chat box to post any questions you have as you go along. And um, uh, hopefully I can answer those questions. I'll try to do it as we go so that we stay on topic. And uh, don't hesitate because I would really like to see you take home something that is useful for you as opposed to giving you just lots of information. Okay, so um, to get started, <clears throat> excuse me, my background, as I said, was in sports science and I was primarily interested in energy systems. So um, what, uh, what we see with those energy systems are that if we look at what contributes Okay, sorry, just finding how to advance my slides there. If we look at uh, what contributes to performance in terms of energy supply, we see that if we give enough energy, we get muscle contracting and your body doing all the things it's supposed to do. And if we can't supply enough energy, then uh, we start to experience what we know as fatigue. But it's not really a question of how much because most of us have plenty of energy stored in our body. Rather, the question is, can we supply energy at a rate um, that is greater than we're using it as? And this is always the problem because as we store energy, we don't have it really in useful packets. And we need to make that transition from having the carbon-carbon bond or the stored energy into the form that the muscle can actually use. Now, it's important to consider the movements that are characteristic of what we're doing because of course, different movements use energy at different rates. And when we ski and ride at the hill, Typically, in order to get our skis to carve and push against the snow, and then for our bodies not to collapse with the downward movement, in other words, we're resisting gravity throwing us down the hill, our muscles have to generate quite a bit of power. 
but we're switching it on and switching it off all the time because the movements aren't continuous. Usually it takes us a I don't know, depending on how fast you ski and how long the run is, let's say somewhere around two to maybe five minutes or so that we're skiing continuously and then we stop and rest and then we get a longer rest as we ride the lift. Now I know there's a lot of backcountry skiers in the community there in the Bow Valley. So when, when you consider that type of movement, it's quite different. In other words, as you climb up, you have a much more moderate pace that lasts for much longer. And then you have the downhill movement to gain. Tonight, we're gonna focus mostly on skiing and riding at the hill. But if you do have questions about other sports or the backcountry aspect, then don't hesitate to ask. Okay, so here's your first question. And um, uh, the what I, I'm going to pose to you is which type of food is the best fuel for faster, powerful movements? And your choices are sugars, complex carbs, proteins, or fats. So I'll just give you a minute here. And it looks like we have about Oh, three quarters or so of the participants having answered. We'll give you another minute here. Okay, so it looks like most people chose carbs. Oh, and it knocked me out of the. There we go. Okay, so we're back in PowerPoint. And uh, most people chose sugars and carbs, which is the correct answer. Uh, let's just see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Okay, so why is this so? Well, it turns out that the enzymes that are located inside our cells that break down those sort of store energy storage units are fastest when we have a simple sugar. That's the unit that goes straight into the energy production system. And sugars also, things that taste sweet that are in the simple sugar form are very fast to digest. Almost as soon as they enter into our mouths, they go into our digestive system and then into the blood. But that also creates problems because if you're at rest, the energy comes in so quickly that your body thinks it needs to store them. And then we don't have them available to our muscle in order to do the contractions we want to. Now, the other thing that happens is that every time we stop, we have to start the whole system up. So you could think about it as a simple sugar is, let's say, being a match, and the match is going to ignite those carbohydrates that would be like the kindling. And then once we get the kindling going, we can get the fat burning system. And the fat burning system has a much, much bigger capacity but it takes a very long time to ramp up. And you'll have to excuse me because I have whatever, my house phone is ringing, which it never rings. So it's probably um, uh, a scam caller, but anyhow, uh, we'll just ignore it and hopefully the answering machine won't kick in. Okay, there we go. All right, so we're, we're back to our, our logs burning now and they are the equivalent of the fat burning system. They have a much bigger capacity. They're gonna burn for a lot longer, but it really takes us a while to get them ramped up. Now, when we combine those sugars together into long chains and they can be branched as well, and we encase them in fiber, we have what we now call a complex carb. And they take quite a, quite a bit longer to digest because again, we have to break the cells open, release the fiber, and then cut those sugar units off. So it's a bit like a timed release of those individual sugar units that our body can use. All right, so now that we know that we need carbohydrates in order for our body to, um, to be able to generate power, what would you choose to eat or drink on the hill um, to impact your risk of injury? So do you think that this is the case, that what you choose to eat or drink can impact your injury? And it looks like the answers are all coming in correct, which is absolutely. What we choose to eat or drink on the hill in the moment can definitely impact our injury rate or our risk of injury. Okay, so 
I think I have to share the results. And for some reason, that knocks me out of PowerPoint presentation mode. So we're back into presentation mode and I'll cancel the question. Okay. All right. So let's find out why. So as it turns out, it's not just about feeling muscle, but rather uh, our brain and our peripheral nerves also prefer sugar as a fuel. And that means if we want our brain to process information, um, both visual and knowledge that we have in terms of what we think about the risk that we're taking, whether it's a good idea or not. And then also to get our nerves to carry the messages to our muscles and then back from our muscles, we need to supply our nervous system with carbohydrate. Um, so in the research that I've done, and I can pull up data from about uh, 15 ski resorts over five years, when we look at the timing of when injuries occur, they happen at the same time that we see these meteors in our blood sugar curves. In other words, when blood sugar falls, we are much more likely to get injured. But statistically, there's no direct correlation between the absolute level of blood sugar and the risk of injury. Instead, what we see is that we can measure changes in reaction time, in decision-making, in accuracy, in risk propensity, in cognition, all of these different parameters when blood sugar fluctuates. So it's the degree of up and down that you see in the curve. In other words, is it going up with the intake of simple sugars and then plummeting back downward because of insulin or because of the muscle consuming the sugar? So each of these parameters is impaired when we have a high degree of variability in the blood sugar curve. And this relationship holds constant, whether I'm looking at uh, skiers or drivers or pilots or um, uh, all of the other different industries that I've looked at this question in. All right, so now that you know that you need enough energy to last your day, um, with that high energy output, would it be best to eat a bacon and egg style breakfast? And what is your choice, true or false? Should I say true? I'm just gonna say false. Yeah, if you could just turn your microphones off so that uh, we don't hear the individual discussions. It's good to discuss it. Okay, so people are a bit unsure as to whether this is a good idea or not. And I'll just share the results. You can see that, um, uh, let's see, it's uh, about 65% false. And again, for some reason, it's clicking me out of, uh, presentation mode. Okay, here we are, back to our bacon and egg breakfast. So uh, the yeah, correct answer is false. And the reason for that is because of what happens when we digest fats. So in the image on the side there, you can see with the salad dressing, how the oil separates out from the water and the spices below. And in order to emulsify that fat, we have to give it a really good shake. So what happens when the fat goes into your stomach, your stomach is also a water environment and it separates out the fat. And the digestive enzymes can't really get at all of the fat because of that separation. So there's a valve on the bottom of your stomach that actually shuts off until your stomach has a chance to emulsify all those fats. In other words, really shake it up and mix it so that it looks more like the image on the right hand side there. And then once the fat is emulsified, it moves into your small intestine. From there, it gets digested, the chains are broken down a little bit, and then we package it and transport it to the liver. In the liver, it has to be processed yet again, packaged, and finally transported out to muscle. So there's quite a bit of delay between when we consume fat and when that, that molecule is actually available to us for energy. 
Then once it goes inside the cell, again, it's still a rather complicated molecule. And so it takes a while for our body to release the energy out of it. When you're looking at a simple sugar, there's only about 12 steps required to get energy out of that bond. But with the fat, it's more like uh, four or five times as many steps in order to start to get the energy out of it. Um, and the other problem is that we can't ever convert that fat back to carbohydrates. So if you recall, with our nervous system not really liking to burn fat, uh, it has to have the carbohydrate. Okay, so um, when you choose your snacks, when you're at the hill, um, this sort of image here, and I, I just chose one bar randomly, one that you might think is one that's quote, healthy. And uh, it says just four real ingredients. So um, it's organic, it doesn't have gluten in it, we have to think about it as being healthy. But if we actually look inside that bar to see whether or not it's going to provide us with the energy we need while we're skiing or riding, we need to find out whether or not it, there's enough fat in it that it's going to delay digestion. And the rule of thumb is around 30%. So if you look at the label, you can see here that it's giving us 12 grams of fat. And nowadays, some of the labels actually convert that into calories for you. So it makes it a little bit easier. But if it hasn't done the calculation for you, you just multiply times nine. So if we say 12 times nine, 108, and you can see that that's almost 50% of the calories in the bar. So this bar is gonna sit in your stomach. If you eat it at 10 o'clock, it's gonna be two o'clock in the afternoon by the time you get the energy out of it. And even though there is carbohydrate in there, the fat is going to take precedence. So with that valve being shut at the bottom of your stomach, you're not going to have access to that fat for that length of time. Okay, so other than fat, we want to consider which uh, ingredients can impact digestion. And so your choices are water, fiber, protein, vitamins and minerals, and then the first three, water, fiber, and protein or all of the above. So in other words, including vitamins and minerals. Uh, Delia, why don't I try, I'll end the poll and try and share it to, to see. Uh, That'd be perfect, thank you. That'd be see helpful. if that improves, uh, yeah. Stops <laughs> you from getting kicked out, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try that this, this go round. So do you, Dilly, do you see the results up there on your screen? I do, yep, yep. So what we have is um, most people thought all of the above, that's at almost 60%, and about a third of the people thought A, B, and C, in other words, the first three. And then there were just a few who thought uh, just fiber and just protein. So uh, let's see if I close this. There we go, that worked much better. Okay, so the answer is E, and um, vitamins and minerals obviously contribute to health, and they're important in the long term when we make choices about what we're going to eat, because we want to make sure that we're getting enough of them. But in the moment, they're not going to change the way we digest food. Um, anything that's in the liquid form will be absorbed faster because of the way it's processed in our stomach. And not only that, but water also helps with all of the other reactions. So it definitely is, um, is going to digest digestion, sorry, affect digestion time. Fiber definitely slows down digestion. We already talked about that. So when we eat a complex carb, it is going to take longer. Um, but lots of products are have added sugar in them. So when you're trying to determine whether or not that's going to be something which might kind of give you that sugar rush very quickly, you can look at the ratio between sugar and fiber. And you want to try for less than five grams of sugar per gram of fiber. 
So uh, if the um, if the ratio is um, better than that, then your food will be delayed in its digestion a little bit, and you'll get more of a timed release. And uh, if the fiber is less than that, uh, you're going to have that sugar enter your bloodstream very quickly. Now, protein we haven't really talked about yet, and it's important for structural function inside your body, but um, it's a more complicated molecule. And so it delays digestion a little bit. And so we can slow down our digestion of complex carbs a little bit more from around one hour to about two hours when we add protein. So we want that protein to make up about a quarter or so up to about a third of each of our snacks. Okay, so um, when we look at our food intake during the day, begin because we have quite a high energy output, would it be better to um, eat a big lunch all at once um, and take a nice rest? or to break it up and snack during the day. Okay, so most people guessed right or made an educated guess about 90% of people said that this is false. And um, those people are absolutely right. So uh, really, it's not so much about total energy, as it is about um, supplying energy in a steady, smooth way throughout the day. We don't wanna have those spikes and drops in blood sugar. Uh, and so in order to stabilize our blood sugar, we're gonna break our meals up into smaller packages and snack. Now, taking a break might be something that you wanna do anyhow. And it's great to go in and have a hot drink and use the washroom and maybe rest for a little bit if you're feeling tired. But otherwise, really what you wanna do is break things up so that you can snack really on the chairlift. So if you take a sandwich, cut it into half or even quarters um, and mix your nuts up with pretzels, a little bit of dried cereal and maybe some raisins or dried apples or something so that you're keeping your fat content down to about 30%. If you are gonna go in and sit down, uh, something like Greek yogurt with fruit makes a great snack. It's not as huge a heavy meal as your standard lunch, and it'll be digested a little bit faster and help stabilize that blood sugar. Um, in, uh, in baked goods, you know, power bars and banana bread and muffins and things like that are also great pocket snacks but you just want to watch again what the fat content is because sometimes especially with the commercially made ones there's a lot of oil in them to try and keep them moist and once you get above that 30 percent fat it's going to take too long to um to digest okay um so moving on to recovery now um, what's the best recovery technique after a hard day of skiing? So your choices are take a nap, uh, stretch, have a hot tub, uh, or have a snack. Okay, so we're looking at about equal distribution between stretching and snacking, those being the frontliners at sort of around 45% each. And then um, there were a few people that chose hot tub, about 10%, but um, nobody went for the nap. That's too bad. Okay, so um, 
the answer, the correct answer is actually to have the snack. First and foremost, that's what you need to do. And this is the reason why. Um, this is a graph showing you muscle glycogen. So glycogen is the carbohydrate that's actually stored directly inside the muscle. And it provides us with a source of carbohydrate for the muscle when we're not taking food in. So let's say in between those two hour, three hour snacks. And so the amount that you have on, on the starting point here, it doesn't really matter, but what happens is, after a day of skiing, you've used up about half of that. Now, the enzymes that put carbohydrate back into the muscle don't work very well. So unless we really concentrate on what it is that we do eat, once we've skied a second day and consume that fixed amount of carbohydrate, you can see that the carb, the carb in your muscle is starting to get very low. And by day three, it's essentially zero. So that's what makes your legs feel heavy. It's not so much fatigue after, let's say, three days of skiing in a row, but rather we just don't have that energy stored inside the muscle anymore in order to provide the muscle with the energy that it needs to contract. So there is a way to get that carb back up. And the secret here is that the enzyme that puts the carbohydrate back into the muscle and resynthesizes the glycogen, so it's called glycogen synthase, is a thousand times more active in the first hour after the end of exercise. So this is where this whole industry of post-exercise recovery drinks comes from, is because if you take in that carbohydrate within the first hour, at the end of exercise, you can top that glycogen back up and it makes a huge difference in your recovery and your fatigue level for the next day. So what should that snack be? What's your best choice for your après ski snack? Uh, wings, which is traditionally very popular. Beer, which is also extremely popular. Pasta in the cream sauce with bits of bacon, nice and tasty. Um, chocolate milk or veggies and dip. So which of these would you choose? Okay, so it looks like almost 50% of people chose chocolate milk. And then we had, oh, about 20% or so choosing beer, choosing the pasta, or choosing the veggies. So let's see here if I can close this. Uh, the answer, of course, is the chocolate milk. And the reason behind this is that you need the food to be digested pretty quickly. When you look at things like wings or nacho or pizza or the pasta in a cream sauce, the fat content is going to be more than 30%. And by now, I hope you remember that when the fat content is that high, it's going to delay the digestion down. So if we don't get that food into our body within that first hour, we're not going to be able to resynthesize our glycogen. Plus, glycogen is carbohydrate and we cannot convert the fat back to carb. So even if we take carb in along with the fat, like the pasta and the rich cream sauce, all of that fat is going to close that valve off on the bottom of our stomach. So we can't get access to that carbohydrate. So things like chocolate milk are great. There's sugar in the chocolate uh, and a little bit of protein as well. Um, other good choices, of course, are cookies, but things that are less than 30% fat. So kind of oatmeal cookies or Fig Newtons or something like that. Um, choice of bars, you know, especially if you're just coming off the ski hill and you're headed out to do something else, do your grocery shopping or whatever, you want to make sure you get something right away. So a bar can be a good choice as long as you check the ingredients. And again, the tea breads, as long as we're a little bit careful about how much fat is in them. Uh, smoothies are also a great choice. And um, 
Uh, I'm going to follow here with a little trick that I use. But, uh, you know, if you have a half of a sandwich or a little bit of um, a wrap left over, that's a great choice too. So we're looking again at about two thirds carbohydrate and one third protein or three quarters carbohydrate, one quarter protein. Okay. So um, especially if you have kids who are in sports and you're short on time, shaker cup smoothies are a great solution. And what you um, can do is just get a big bag of dry milk powder. You don't need to buy expensive uh, protein powders. The milk powder has both casein, which is uh, a protein which is digested a little bit slower, and the whey protein, which is what um, sort of the protein powder that you buy in the big jars is made out of. It's a faster digesting one, and the milk sugar. But of course, the dry milk powder doesn't taste very good, so you want to flavor it. And you can do that with something like Nestle's Quick or Orange Tang. Um, or uh, if you uh, like the, or the taste of coffee and you're having it maybe a little earlier in the day, um, a little bit of instant coffee or um, dehydrated peanut butter and sugar. And the reason dehydrated is just because if you use regular peanut butter, it's going to be difficult to get it to mix in. Anyhow, it can sit in the bottom of a pack or a gym bag or whatever. And uh, when you need that emergency lift uh, or after your hard workout, before you head off to your next activity, you just add some water, give it a really good shake, and you have your perfect uh, protein drink there. Carbohydrate. Uh, Dilio, we've, we've had a couple of questions. Uh, so for those, awesome. yeah, for those that um, are lactose intolerant, uh, what are some of the other options? Mm -hmm. So there are lots of, um, of other sources of protein that you can buy, vegetable-based protein or vegan proteins that come as dry powders. It's just they're going to be a bit more expensive. And if you get one that's flavored, it's likely already going to have sugar and flavoring in it. So you, you may or may not need to add more to it for that. But for sure, there are alternatives that are not milk based. It's just they're going to be quite a bit more expensive. And what about we had uh, one person ask about chocolate oat milk? Yeah. So um, if you're using a milk substitute, one um, that's probably going to be a liquid rather than a powder, which is fine. It's just it won't store or transport quite the same. So um, if you use um, a soy milk or an oat milk or uh, a different product like that, again, you want to just check the fat content because, for example, nut milks can have quite high fat in them. And then you're going for something that is going to be a little bit higher in sugar and higher in protein or higher in the carbohydrate that will digest quickly. So you just have to look at the ingredients a little bit but they certainly will work. Thanks, yeah. Delia. Okay, all right. So there's the after after ski meal. Um, well, we did put beer on there as a choice and there were a number of people who selected it. So let me ask you, which of the following would not be a reason to have a beer after your day on the hill? I can read out the choices. A is getting together for a debrief where we get to tell everybody about our day, create some very positive social connections. B, beer is mostly water. Is that a good or a bad thing? C, beer contains carbohydrate. Again, a good or a bad thing. And D, other compounds in beer can ask to lower your risk. Um, can act to lower your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and osteoporosis, which is weak bones. And then the final choice is B and C, that beer has water and contains carbohydrate. So remember, we're looking for the incorrect answer. Okay, so this one was a bit trickier. Uh, most people chose B and C, that it would not be a reason. Whereas I kind of think the fact that beer has water and carbohydrate in it would be a positive. Anyhow, about 65% of people chose that one. 
Um, and uh, the other most popular choice is 30% or so that uh, certain compounds in beer can act in a positive way for health. So let's get this out of the way. Oh, sorry. You want to go back to here. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to try and get rid of this and I can't. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, so uh, the reason that I put this question in is because uh, there was actually an article recently in um, Outdoor Magazine that talked about all of these positive health benefits uh, for beer. And um, sorry, I'm just going to try and get rid of this again. But Okay, I don't know. Julianne, can you close question eight? I guess you probably No, that's can. just so that for some reason is just the box that's popping up in your own screen. We can't see that. Oh, you can't. End. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it's obscuring my view, but if it's not obscuring your view, then I'll just try to ignore it and pretend. Okay. All right. So um the the reasons that um that we're gonna look at as being important about whether or not we have a beer at the end of the day um, include uh, the problem with alcohol. And it turns out that alcohol inhibits an, uh, a particular hormone that our body releases when it's dehydrated. So if you're not dehydrated, it's not that big a deal because uh, the reuptake of water from the filtrate isn't going to be that critical. But when you are dehydrated, that hormone is essential for restoring that fluid back into our body. And it's that particular um, hormone which alcohol inhibits. So usually people self dehydrate during the day, partly because they don't have access to water and partly because we don't like to drink a lot because then we'll have to go in and use the washroom. And so uh, the impact of the alcohol after exercise becomes more important. But the biggest problem with uh, having that beer after uh, a day of skiing is that um, it's quite filling. And because there is a fair bit of fluid in it, it shuts off the thirst reflex. And so it kind of gets in the way of us following these behaviors which are important for restoration in other words making sure that we rehydrate at the end of the day and we get our food snack so there are, you know the positive reasons for having that beer in terms of getting together with friends and enjoying yourself and really reliving your day and and uh, establishing those connections are, are very good but we just really want to make sure that we keep our focus on uh, having water together with the alcohol and making sure that we still have our post-exercise carbohydrate snack. Um, if you did read that article in Outdoor Magazine and you're now convinced that beer and, you know, these things show up every couple of years where I think a little while ago people said that red wine was had a really positive effect on preventing cardiovascular disease those things um, are really minor effects. So if you look at the clinical impact, it's really, really minimal. Whereas the downside to the alcohol is a much bigger effect. So um, those aren't really a reason to take up drinking. And if you do keep in mind that they, it's very modest amounts of alcohol that uh, create those positive effects. So one serving, and we have to be a bit careful about that because most glasses that you, when you order a beer or a glass of wine in the bar, they're really two servings of alcohol or, or uh, so you've already reached uh, the limit of what might potentially give you a positive health effect. Okay, um, so I also just, put- We just have a quick question, Delia. Sorry to interrupt you just mm -hmm. uh, from um, a few slides ago, but this one's from Irene asking, is there much insulin produced to process the sugars oh. when you are eating to refuel the muscles after exercise? 
Ah, great question, Irene. So the answer to that is yes, there is. And uh, especially if you keep the protein a little bit low and you go for those sweeter snacks. But um, in that particular instance, it can be a positive effect because the insulin is quite anabolic. And so it actually almost acts a little bit like getting a little hit of testosterone. If there's been any muscle damage or we're hoping to, let's say, maybe build a bit more muscle in response to our, our exercise for the day, the insulin can have an anabolic effect. Now, if you are pre-diabetic and you're concerned about your sugar levels, you might want to stay with a bit more protein and a little bit less sugar. But for people who don't have that health concern, it can actually be quite a positive thing. It's the one time when you do want insulin around because it will speed up recovery. Okay, all right. So um, there's nothing wrong with stretching. And of course, it can feel really good because um, muscles that are tired or have been uh, injured just a little bit will have a reflex contraction and shorten. And I think uh, all of us know about that tension that we get, let's say, in our traps where uh, our shoulders start to come up and come up because um, the muscle is actually kind of in a negative feedback loop and it keeps on shortening and shortening and shortening. So releasing that tension at the end of the day can be a really beneficial thing. But stretching is probably the most abused form um, of exercise or recovery that I know of. So the technique that I like to recommend or that I teach with my um, programs is called PNF stretching. And what it does is it makes use of the reflexes that are already pre-programmed inside our body to get our muscles to relax. So the way it works is we're going to try and trick our nerve into relaxing the muscle instead of contracting it. And the way that you do that is actually to actively contract the muscle that you want to stretch. You hold it for about three seconds, and then you need to relax it completely. And because normal muscle patterns, for example, when you're walking, you take a step and first the muscles in the front of your leg are going to contract to pull your leg through. And then the muscles in the back of your leg are going to contract to raise your heel up. So our body sort of expects for this um, us to go through this pattern of contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. So we're fooling it into doing that by contracting the muscle and then relaxing it completely. The hard part is that you have to figure out a way then to increase the stretch without actively moving the muscle. Because if you fire the nerve to the muscle, you're going to interrupt that relaxation loop. So um, this is how we're going to do it. And because I don't have a setup here to show you um, on myself, I'm going to show you a little video. So you want to have a good position there on the floor with your body well supported. And then um, what you're going to see here is she has her hand pushing against her knee. So the muscle that we want to stretch is down here along her, her uh, butt. And those are the glutes, right? And when we ski and we set our edge, we really recruit those glutes so they get very tight. So in order to get that muscle to relax, she's contracting against her hand for three seconds and then relaxing completely. Her hand is preventing her knee from coming back in and that gets all the muscles on the front of her leg to shorten. So the muscles on the back of her leg have to relax. And then to passively increase the stretch, you can see she's starting to push off on her heel. 
So she's not using the muscles of the leg that she wants to stretch at all. She's using her, the force against the wall to increase the stretch. So as she goes up there on her toe, it brings your leg closer to your chest and increases the stretch. And if that doesn't give you enough of a stretch, what you can do is actually move a little bit closer to the wall. So that will increase the amount of movement against this muscle in the back. But she still needs to keep her alignment with her back flat and, um, and her, uh, her bum flat on the floor. Okay, so uh, we have our next question, question nine. Which is the best pre-bedtime routine? Do you want to watch a little bit of television in order to relax? Uh, check your email so you don't have to worry about it. Make sure there's nothing pending for the morning. Um, do 10 minutes of focused stretching with maybe a little bit of conscious breathing, sort of meditation, or all of the above. Okay, so most people chose focused uh, stretching and meditation, uh, which was the correct answer. So that was 80% of, uh, of the participants. And um, the reason for that is uh, the blue light from um, the screen is, uh, will inhibit the release of melatonin, which is something that helps us, uh, a hormone inside our body that builds up and helps us relax and go to sleep. So try to stay away from your screen before bed. And um, certainly checking your email would both give you screen time, plus start getting you thinking about what's coming up tomorrow, which can, um, prevent us from relaxing and going to sleep. Whereas spending 10 minutes of with a little bit of focused stretching and a little bit of breathing is a really nice way to relax and stop thinking about your day um, so that we're able to fall into sleep a little bit easier. Now, um, getting enough sleep is very important in terms of energy, uh, sorry, injury prevention. And um, what we know, and a lot of this data comes from the change with daylight savings time, is that even one hour of, um, of sleep loss can impact our ability to, um, to be vigilant and to have fast reaction times. So when they look at um, in accident rates with motor vehicle accidents uh, in the week after daylight savings switching, uh, what they see is a, as a significant increase in the number of motor vehicle accidents. We used to think that you could build up a sleep deficit and then one really good sleep would meet up um, all the requirements of that deficit. And we now know that's not true, that even um, a little bit of sleep loss, like an hour a day, really builds up and you don't totally restore your reaction time and your cognitive processing until you make up the entire deficit. Um, naps are a great way to get a little bit of extra sleep in. And a lot of people think that if they nap, it's gonna prevent them from sleeping at night. But really, when, if you think about that total deficit and having to make up the deficit, um, the, the nap can really help you uh, work towards making sure that you get enough sleep. The critical piece there is to uh, keep the nap time to less than 20 minutes. And the reason for that is because when we first fall asleep, our sleep is relatively shallow. And then we progress through different phases. Uh, so what is really a negative experience is to wake up when we're in the really deep phase. And it's hard to predict with people exactly how long that will be. It varies from person to person. So you either have to be under 20 minutes or basically over two hours. And two hours is kind of too much of an interruption in your day and then potentially could keep you from sleeping at night. So a uh, better rule of thumb is to keep it to that 20 minutes, but it can be very restorative, even just in that under 20 minutes time period. 
the other thing that can really help is to make sure that if we aren't getting enough hours of sleep, that we do make sure that the sleep that we get allows us to fall into that really deep phase of sleep. And so some of the things that contribute there are again, staying away from the blue light, having our space be dark and quiet and actually at a cooler temperature. So it's a bit better to have a nice thick blanket on your bed and sleep in a cold environment will help your body go into that deeper phase of sleep. Um, for people that are sharing accommodation, because often when I teach this for employees at the ski hill, it can be a real problem. So using aids like um, uh, earplugs and an eye mask can help. Okay, so um, caffeine, what about that coffee? Uh, do you need to avoid caffeine in the afternoon? Is this really something that's important to do in order to make sure that your sleep is good quality or for injury prevention? True or false? Okay, so uh, most people said true, and uh, about 30% of people said false. So uh, this isn't really fair because the answer is it depends. Um, it turns out that caffeine is actually one of the very few performance aids, or we call them ergogenic aids, that really does work. So caffeine can raise your vigilance, it activates your sympathetic nervous system, it makes you more alert, it speeds up your reaction time, it makes it easier to pay attention. So uh, when I work with mountain guides and I ask them what is the most dangerous part of their jobs, the answer is the drive to and from the lodge. So for people who are commuting up from the city, uh, having a cup of coffee before you leave the ski hill can definitely help um, make sure that you stay alert for that drive home, which can be very difficult, lots of traffic in the dark with uh, bad weather and road conditions. But what we want to keep in mind is how long it takes us to process caffeine. So um, it turns out that the caffeine will stay in your body for up to 10 hours and at six hours, half of the caffeine has dissipated. So if you know you're going to be driving home, let's say around four o'clock, you can have the caffeine at three, which means that the caffeine is peaking while you're driving but keeping in mind that at nine o'clock, then you still have about half of that caffeine in your bloodstream and it won't be until midnight or even after that, that the caffeine levels really fall off. So a bit of a trade-off there. If the roads are really bad and you're tired, it's probably worthwhile having that cup of coffee to make sure that you get home safe. You maybe won't have as good a night's sleep that particular night but um, the risk exposure during the drive is probably the most dangerous part of your day. Okay, so um, I've given you lots of information tonight and um, I know I've been stumbling a little bit here, but it's a bit difficult because my whole screen is, is <laughs> blocked off by question number 10, but I hope that uh, the flow of information was still okay. Um, I run a Facebook page for the employee program, which is open access, and anyone is welcome to come. Early season, there's lots of exercises and uh, preseason prep type activities, and then through the season, there'll be recipes and tips on recovery and those kinds of things. Um, the Canada West Ski Area Association houses some of my work, so you can go to that website and have a look and get um, uh, some handouts with some recipes and things like that. Um, there's a lot of the fit to work programming on the BC Forest Safety Council website, so the programs um, not necessarily directly related to skiing, but uh, certainly if you're interested in this style of injury prevention, Again, there's a lot of information that's open access.
uh, there. And then the Fit for Snow or Fit to Work programs, um, I deliver really only through an employee employee program. So um, uh, not one-on-one. -on -one. Anyhow, I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, I will hang on. I know I went over here. I was afraid it was going to be too long, but um, I'll stick around for a few questions if, if anyone wants. Thank you, Delia. Does anyone have any other final questions? Okay, yeah, we have a few. Um, so uh, Diana is asking, what does a good breakfast look like? Right. So um, again, unfortunately, the answer is it depends a little bit. Um, what time you get up relative to what time you expect to be on the snow. So the way that you can look at it is uh, uh, the digestion time, knowing that if you add more fat to it, it will take longer to digest. So if you have three hours or so until you're going to start skiing, you probably could have the bacon and eggs. If it's going to be only an hour, then you probably want to have something which is more fast digesting, like maybe oatmeal with fruit. Um, you probably don't want to have something that's high in sugar because at rest, if you have a lot of sugar, it will cause you to release insulin and then you'll be starting out your day with your blood sugar at it bottomed out which should really not be a good idea so generally a combination of complex carbs and protein and then you can add fat into it depending on how long you have for it to digest any other questions for dr roberts Okay, well, if not, um, I'd really like to thank uh, Delia for joining us tonight. It was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we've had a few people comment already that they love the information. So thank you, Delia, and that they would love to see more Zoom presentations like this. So thank you, Sharice. Um, and also, oh, okay, we do have a quick question. Is molasses considered a sugar? Ah, yes, absolutely. And again, that's a great question because sometimes uh, we are told that different sources like honey or molasses might be healthier than white sugar, brown sugar, raw sugar. But when it comes to energy supply, all your body cares about is how many carbons they are and how it's arranged. And so molasses is a simple sugar and it's going to basically be digested in your mouth. By the time it gets into your stomach, it will jump directly into your bloodstream. And then along similar lines, uh, Kenneth is asking if dark chocolate is a good snack at the end of the day. Right. So um, that's a great question. And dark chocolate, again, it's a little bit like um, those reports that come out that um, that a little bit of wine or a little bit of beer is positive for your health. So chocolate has just a little bit of antioxidants in it, lots of fat and lots of sugar. And uh, so the answer to that would be yes, especially if you had something that also had some carbohydrate in it. So the chocolate mixed with a bit of dried fruit or, um, you know, a, a biscuit type covered in chocolate so that you have a little bit more carbohydrate and a little bit less fat. And so he's fruit asking with dark chocolate, that would be ideal. A dark chocolate with nuts, perhaps? Yeah, so the nuts are mostly fat, so probably not just not, because yeah. of the fat content, right? It's just going to take a bit too long to digest. Okay, looks, I don't see any other questions. Um, I do also want to say thank you to those of you that did donate as part of signing it, registering for this talk. Um, it definitely helps. Uh, because we're a charity, uh, donations help us uh, bring more talks like this. So, um, and other ways to stay connected with us. I mean, if you're on Facebook, uh, you can visit us on our Facebook page, uh, visit our website, sign up to our newsletter. Uh, when we do have upcoming events, 
Um, we do post them or send them out on our quarterly newsletter as well as we post them on our Facebook and Twitter channels. Um, so if you do you know, want to stay connected to see what's coming up in the new year, uh, we are going to try to provide more op educational opportunities such as this. Um, and yeah, if you have any ideas for future uh, talks as well that you would like to uh, hear, just pop them in the chat as well. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. And especially thank you to uh, Dr. Roberts for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks for all your great questions. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Good night.